This will be the first real video in motivated analysis video series. We're going to work on, think about uh, hitting springs with hammers as a very concrete introduction to um, how delta functions appear in a very concrete setting. Uh, let me make sure you know that this is going to be working out of a PDF that you can get from mountainofmath.wordpress.com. Go to the Motivated Analysis homepage and then just click on the link for the first handout, Hitting Springs with Hammers. So um, I'm going to assume that you have that in front of you. Um, and I might show the PDF occasionally, but I'm going to do it mostly on uh, the board here. So we've got a typical mass spring system, mass m, spring constant k. And y is going to be our variable determined uh, that's describing the displacement of the mass from equilibrium. So y equals 0 is equilibrium. And then we're going to apply a force to it. And we're eventually going to get a model that's quite a bit like a simplified, idealized model of hitting something with a hammer, delivering a lot of impulse or transfer of momentum in a short time. Uh, to make things simple, as I say in the, in the handout, the spring, the damping constant that's often pre present in one of these problems for now is going to be 0. And the initial conditions are going to be zero. So the only thing that's making it move is the forcing. And we'll talk about how we can in, um, include the initial conditions as well and make it all into sort of one, one theory. Um, because often you see these as two separate things, but it's not that hard to include this into this once you have the technology that we're going to develop. OK, so number one, we've got, um, I actually write it in a slightly different way from my, how I did in the intro to this PDF, m y double prime plus m omega squared y equals f of t, the forcing function, and also the zero initial conditions. So I wrote it this way to remind ourselves of this, the solution to the homogeneous equation. When this is zero, then the solution is just y of t is um, a cosine omega t plus b sine omega t. And so omega is the natural frequency and that's in radians per second so it's an angular frequency and so k the answer to part of part a k is just m omega squared okay or omega is root k over m very standard result in this kind of thing okay now just to get a sense of all of the, oh yeah, and then I'm going to make this more explicit. That f of t is now a step function. It's something that is a function of time, turns on at a with a certain height, and we'll figure out that height in a minute, and then turns off delta t later, a plus delta t later. So it's just this rectangular pulse. And the height is j over delta t. And you might wonder why it's written in a complicated way as something over something. And we'll, that'll be in the answer to B. Okay, so this is J over delta T, rectangular pulse A to A plus delta T. You can see this, right? Yeah, of T. Okay, so units, mass is going to be in kilograms if we're in SI units, for example, just to make things really explicit. It's always good in physical problems to keep track of your units, dimensional analysis, like the physicists say. Y is in meters. That's going to be meters per second squared. Uh, this is kilograms. Omega is a, a rate. It's a velocity. It's an angular velocity. So it's radians per second, but that's really just per second because radians are not really a real unit. Um, this guy is dimensionless. It's just uh, it's either zero or one. This is time. This is seconds again. So that explains if we the only hopefully the only mysterious thing would be maybe what the J is here. J, let's see, this is kilograms meters per second squared. This is all in newtons. Oh, of course, because this is supposed to be a force. This is a force balance equation. And so this is it needs to be force times time, so that when you divide it by time, you get force. So that's newton seconds, or in other words, kilogram meters per second. That is the unit of momentum, linear momentum. And so it's an amount of momentum. And that's really what the answer to B is about. Let me make, give myself more room, even though I have to draw, erase the picture. So B, see if I answered A, yeah, 
Okay. Um, the integral from zero to infinity. We're going to be dealing with improper integrals all over the place here because we're going to ask a lot of questions about what's the total thing that happens or what happens over in the entire real line. This is our first example. Okay, well, that's just the integral. There's nothing, there's nothing fancy. It's the integral of this step function. Okay, let's redo the picture here. And this height is j over delta t. That's a delta, not an a. And this width is delta t. Oh, okay, so the integral is j. So, but what does this mean? For any f of t, for any forcing function, we're integrating force times time. Okay, so the integral of force times time for some force that's acting on a system is the total momentum transferred from whatever external system is creating this force. We're not worried, we're not worrying about where it's coming from, uh, to this system. And that's our total momentum transferred, and that's often called the impulse. Okay, and so uh, J is not at all a coincidence that it had units of momentum, because it really is just measures the total momentum that we're transferring to the system. And we're transferring in a very simple way. We're pushing it with a constant force for a certain amount of time and then just letting it go. And we are going to pretty soon uh, imagine delta T is a small time, which you suggested by the notation, and then J over delta T is going to be rather big if J is, is held constant. And so we're going to get something like a spike, like this, for our F of T. And that's when we want to think about it as a model of hitting with a hammer. Okay, so what about C? Uh, oh yeah, I should have said at the start, um, the reason I do it, things this way, having these handouts as questions, is that it's really much, much better to do as much as possible, if you want to learn this, um, really try on your own to do the handout, and maybe skip some stuff, it's confusing, it's fine. Um, and only then, if you need to, watch a video like this. Um, and don't just watch the videos one after the other. But, you know, if you don't have a time for anything else, go ahead, watch the videos, that's fine. I get more views that way. Okay, so y of t when t is less than a. Okay, remember we had zero initial conditions. It's partly for simplicity, but it's really, it's going to bring out some, some aspects of the system that really are much more complicated if we didn't have zero initial conditions. So the, there's nothing going on initially, and so obviously before t equals a, nothing's going to go on here. The unique solution to this differential equation with zero initial conditions and zero forcing is just going to be zero. Okay, so that's cool. So remember, so this is f of t here. Okay, and then we're going to try and get a sense of y of t. So this is a very basic thing about all the things we're going to be doing. Very often we're going to have some some forcing, some input to a system. It's going to have three things. We're going to have a system. Let me write this down. A system, which is modeled by the mass, the, the relevant parameters, that is, are the mass, the spring constant, whatever damping constant. There's going to be an input, and in this case, that's the forcing to the system, something that we control, usually, or often. Um, and then the output is the solution, or the behavior of the system. And hopefully, if you've taken some differential equations, you've seen this, this kind of model, or this idea of you're inputting some information to a system, some sort of control or attempted control, and then you look at the behavior of the system as the output, and you want to understand as well as possible how they're related. What, what a given forcing gives as a given behavior, and even more, if you want a given behavior, what do you do as the forcing, the inverse problem? Okay, so at this point, boring, we just got zero, okay? And then the question is, what happens after that? There's going to be two different stages where the force, forcing is active, and then after the forcing is active, it's not going to just go down to zero. You're going to have, you're going to set this spring in motion. Almost certainly, it's going to keep going. Okay. So um, now there's various ways proceeding next, but I want to do, at least for this first handout, the most what I think is the most straightforward way, which is go piecewise, just go from time t equals zero forward, and that's what I'm suggesting in part D which is, let's do this part in here as just a new problem with a certain initial condition at A and a very simple forcing function, a constant forcing function, okay? But first of all, in part D, I'm asking about 
the issue, and this is already in the very, very first handout, we're bringing up the issue of pushing calculus beyond what we should really be very comfortable with based on like a calc 1, calc 2 understanding. Calculus usually is all about continuous functions, differentiable functions. This is not. And we always want to ask, are we do we really are push are we really pushing ourselves? Is this liable to be just bogus? Do we have to invent totally new technology to understand this, which we will pretty soon with delta functions and things like that? Or is it actually something that's really fine? And here it's actually benign. Because when we've got this differential equation equals this f of t, going from f to y is more like integrating. When you the most basic differential equation almost would be like this when there's no m omega squared at all and then we really would just be divided by m which better not be zero of course and then we're integrating twice and integrating this is a huge theme so maybe i should have la labeled this as a theme in the intro video integrating is most is almost impossible to screw up especially if you have a really good theory of integration and it tends to make functions nicer we're going to see this all the way through it tends to smooth out functions. Um, and part of that you can see just from the fundamental theorem of calculus, because the derivative of the integral gets you back to where you started. Once you integrate once, you know it's going to have a derivative because it's what you started with. And the more you integrate, the more it makes things nicer. Okay, That, that qualitative uh, aspect of integration I don't think is emphasized very much in practical calculus classes. Though. Okay, I'm looking at my, my cheat sheet here. Okay. Um, so, if we integrate this step function, I'm going to draw it one, one more time, if we were just integrating, then once we would get something that's um, continuous, but not differentiable. If we just take the integral of that, it goes from something at zero to constant upward slope, and then constant. Okay. And remember, when I draw this, I should be really careful. I'm not saying that that's really part of the graph of the function. I'm just being a little sloppy. Okay, and as I pointed out in the PDF at the start, I don't care what the value is here or here. I don't care if there's an open circle or a closed circle. Any of that nonsense that they make you obsess about, or many teachers like me, makes you obsess about in a Calc 1 class. It's not that important here. It's very rarely important, and I'll let you know when it is. Okay, then if we integrate again, we're going to get something 0, and then the integral of this guy is going to start out slope 0, then get higher and higher slope and then go to constant slope it's actually rather nice okay this guy is differentiable its derivative is this this guy is differentiable except at these two points we know that sharp corners aren't technically differentiable and then this guy isn't even continuous okay so it looks like this should be maybe very, very roughly the kind of niceness level that y should have. And we're part of the, the point of this whole series is to make statements like that precise. What does niceness level mean? Um, and what are there's some different ways to measure it, and what are the right ways? OK. Um, so it's getting kind of long, this first video. So the next part, we'll go ahead and go into E and the actual explicit solution. Um, but again, try it yourself, please.